to um, some verses that we were to look at this past week as we gathered uh, on Wednesday for prayer and we opened for prayer. And we were encouraged to listen as we cry out to God on behalf of our nation not to reject us. And from Ezekiel it says, have pity on us as we stand in the gap on behalf of our land. So as we gather together and we stand and be half of the people in our world and in our nation, our land, we come before God and we claim our pro- your promise, God, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. As we gather today, we want to confess our sins and come before God and acknowledge that he is the God who forgives us and pours out upon us his grace. For God sent his Son Jesus to save us from our sins. So let us draw near to us. Let us ask God to deliver us from the evil in our world. 
Jeremiah says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on my name and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Let us come before God with all our heart. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. We seek your presence. We seek your wisdom. We seek your strength. Lord, as we gather here today, we come before you humbly, acknowledging that there are sins all around us and sins within us. And so, Lord, we confess what we are part of, what is going on in our world, what we can control and what we cannot control. And Lord, we come before you today acknowledging that you are the holy God, the one and only that we come before you, Lord, to worship, to praise, to adore you. And to know, Lord, that you have sent your Son for our salvation and our forgiveness. Thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your love as we gather today. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to praise God as we stand and sing our praise songs. Oh, 
This is the time we talk to the children. And because it is Father's Day, we want to talk a moment about fathers. We're going to talk today about uh, Abraham, Father Abraham. And Abraham was the father of uh, many nations, many people. So I thought I'd do a little survey here and ask, in your family, what is the largest number of kids that somebody had that you know of, like grandparents or whatever? Anybody come from a family that had a family of 12 or more? Anybody knows 12 or more? How many? 15. How many, Carol? 13. 15. Imagine 15 kids. We had two, that was enough. 15 kids. We think that's, that's, a, that's a lot. But God told Abraham he was going to be the father of many nations, as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Now, I, I've done this. It's, it's interesting. Maybe you'd like to do that with your kids. Um, go to a beach and, and pick up a handful of sand and, and try to start counting it. <laughs> you're not going to get very far. and You're, you're going to give up. But just imagine that, that Abraham is the father of, of, of that many people. Uh, and he, but he didn't just give birth to those and raise them in his house. He was the father of many people because he was their spiritual father. He was the one that, that listened and obeyed God and showed faith. So he was their father of faith. And so as we, we live today and we think about all uh, the kids that our parents have and we celebrate fathers, let's remember that Abraham taught us how about being faithful and listening and being faithful to God. And that's the most important thing that fathers can teach their children. And we can learn that as we read about Abraham. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all the children. All the children of Abraham. Those who continue on the legacy of faith that he taught us. That to be obedient and listen and follow through. And so, Lord, we, we ask that these children will learn from their fathers, from other men, from their mothers, from their brothers and sisters, from, from their Sunday school teachers, from their, from their leaders in whatever aspect of life they encounter. May they find people who are faithful and teach them. And may they learn and be faithful and continue on that pattern, Lord, knowing that they are a child, a precious child of God and a child of Abraham who demonstrates faith and obedience and love. In your name we pray. Amen. Have your Bibles with you. We're going to turn to Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 18. It will also be up on the screen as we go through this morning's message. Genesis chapter 22, we begin our reading at the first verse. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning. Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I go and the boy over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? 
Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son's. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day, as it said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called out to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Here ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you today. We've opened your word and now open our hearts to listen, to be obedient, to be receptive, to learn from you, to be challenged by your word. May your word be what guides and directs our life, our words, and our deeds. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to Father's Day. I didn't, and I didn't open with that. I thought, well, we'll just wait a little while, see if somebody may have forgotten. I didn't want to shock anybody. But most of us know it's Father's Day. And on this Father's Day, we want to look at the title of the message says, Father of All Time. Now you may be wondering, who voted on this? Who decided? Um, in years past, we've had the Man of the Year and the Woman of the Year that Time Magazine would put out until 1999, and then they changed it to Person of the Year. And, and that was voted on. But there, there, there's no voting on who is the Father of All Time. I did some research to look at if they had anything like this, and the only thing I could come up with is the five best fathers, I'm not sure who, how they figured that out, and the five worst, and I know how they figured out the five worst, because one of the worst fathers of all time was Herod the Great. And if you know the biblical accounts, Herod the Great had family members killed because he was afraid that they might overthrow his kingdom. So he was very ruthless. And so you can see why he would go to the head of the line as one of the worst fathers uh, of all time. But today we're looking at, at Abraham. I, I classify him as the father of all time. And I think as we look at Abraham today, Abraham something, has something to tell us. Uh, man... Men, women, and children can learn from Abraham. If you're, you're, you're not a father or you're a little child, you can still learn from Abraham. So we're going to get right in here. One of the first things we learn from Abraham is not about raising children, but it's the first point this morning if you brought your outline. Abraham was obedient to God. In verse 1 of chapter 22, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Now, Abraham is 99 years old. Now, at 99, you'd think he should get a pass. He should not have to be doing anything, right? It's time for the younger generation to step up. He's done his time. He's done his duty. 99 years old. He should not be called on God for a task. But he was. Now God, sometime later, God tested Abraham. God told Abraham at the age of 75 that he was going to become a great nation. And he promised that he had a son. And now he's 99 years old. 
And he has been obediently waiting. 25 years to wait patiently for a son. How many of you would wait 25 years for anything? Some of us, some of us, struggle waiting 24 hours. Some of us, you know, a couple hours. Some of us, it's a, it's a few minutes. Go to get carry out at a restaurant. How many of us are not frustrated? Like, you know, it, it, see, it's taking forever. Forever is minutes. And just think, 25 years, almost you know, 25 years, this man has been waiting for God to fulfill his promise. How many of us would be uh, obedient? How long is your patience with God? Have you ever doubted or questioned God? God's plan, wondered why he's so removed from implementing? How many right now are wondering, where is God? Why, why has God allowed this, this, this pandemic, this, the, the things that are going on in our world? Why has God allowed it? Where is God? Why is it taking so long? God has a, a cure. Why? Well, well, God can fix it. He can heal leprosy. He can heal COVID-19. Why is God taking so long? Where is God? Well, that's the second thing we learn. Because Abraham was not only obedient, but Abraham was patient with God. We need to be obedient to God as we face uncertain times. We must remain faithful. We must be obedient. We must be patient. I have had discussion with some of you, and we've talked about the frustration that people are going through. And all that we hear, and where is truth today in our world? We are told by experts, and we're supposed to believe experts, right? They've gone to school, they've studied, and they're experts. And so experts in the, in the health department tell us, wear a mask. Experts in the health department say, don't wear a mask, it's going to compromise your immune system. And who do we believe in these days? Where is the truth? And how many of us carry over what we hear, what we're struggling with now, to the Word of God and say, where is God? Where is truth? And how many are struggling with obedience and patience? I know listening and going through this time can, can wear us out, can dull our senses. And I know I need to be reminded that we need to be obedient. We need to be obedient and patient with God. Abraham waited almost 25 years. Why can't I wait a day? Why can't I wait an hour? What has caused me to be so impatient, so, so frustrated with God? We need to turn to the truth of God's word and let that direct and guide us. Now is a time to listen to God speaking to us. Now as we hold God, uh, Abraham up as a, on a pedestal, as we, we give him the trophy, and I can imagine if you've seen um, the Stanley Cup, the uh, NBA trophy, the NFL trophy, if we're going to award somebody father of all time, that trophy's got to be about seven foot tall. I mean, Abraham's going to walk around with this huge trophy, and as we award him this huge trophy, and we put him up on this pedestal, and we lift him up as father of all time, we think, here's a man that we need to follow and just follow in his footsteps. But we need to be cautious. Because as we lift him up as the father of all times, as someone who is obedient and someone who is patient, the third point is, Abraham was not a perfect man. 
He had flaws, but he still trusted God. If you read the story of Abraham as he's, he's traveling, he's going through these different lands, he becomes afraid because his wife Sarah is quite a looker at the spry age of 70. Some of you think, well, I'm 70. Well, you know, look at the Bible, you, you know. So at the age of 70, his wife Sarah was very beautiful. And he was afraid. He was afraid that these other nations would say, hey, this guy, her husband, let's get rid of him. Let's, let's kill him and we'll take his wife. So he says to Sarah, lie to them. Tell them you're my sister and then they won't kill me. Well, the nation discovered that he had told this lie and they feared and they sent him away. But here's this man who, who says, I'm going to be obedient to God. I'm going to trust God's given to me a plan. And we notice he's got a flaw. Now, how can we say in the same breath that Abraham is obedient and then we can say he didn't always trust God? Because he's human, just like you and me. There are times that, that, that we fall to the, to the temptation of sin. It, it, it is natural. We're not proud. We're not up here. I'm not up here to say yes, you know. Uh, I've sinned many times. I'm very proud of it. No. But we all deal with it because he was, he was human. And this character flaw does not eliminate him from being used by God. What we learn today is God used Abraham even though he had sin within him because God takes and molds us and uses us. Now that does not say, I'm not saying this morning and don't hear this and don't go out and say, well, the pastor said lying or cheating is okay. No, I'm not saying that's okay. That's what Abraham did and it was wrong, but God still used him. And we all battle with right and wrong. But God can still use us. Of course God can use us. If God were not going to use sinners, who would he use? Because we're all sinners. What book of the Bible do we find for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? What book? Anybody know? I didn't ask you for the verse. I thought that'd be too hard. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans. Paul, Romans, yep, Romans. The book of Romans. All have sinned and fall short of the glory. Not just some, not just certain people, not those other people who we see and we point out. It says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So God has to use Abraham. There's, there's not other choices. The only perfect person was Jesus Christ, who had no sin. So Abraham, in spite of his flaws, was used by God to be the father of many nations. So Abraham has this son. And here he is tested in chapter 22. Sometime later after everything that had gone on, after he had lied, and after God had made the promise, and he's waited all this time, God tested Abraham. Now it's interesting, in verse 2, God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son. I kind of find that God has a sense of humor. Because every time he's talking to Abraham, he reminds him like Abraham's been made a promise he's got one boy it's like how in the world is he going to forget that he's only got one boy but every time God addresses him your son in case you don't remember him his name's Isaac he's your only son it's like okay come on God I've I, you know I, I, I've heard it I've heard it over and over again I know it and I, I just find it humorous that God keeps telling him that your only son in case you forgot so he, he takes him, 
and they go to sacrifice him. Can you imagine? To sacrifice his son. We, we struggle with some things in, in faith in God. And can you imagine the faith it would take to even, even consider, just listening to the words, sacrifice him as a burnt offering. I mean, that, that's, 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 I mean, I don't want to watch the Abraham movie. I won't watch Moses' Ten Commandments. I don't want to watch the Abraham movie. I don't want to think about somebody who's getting prepared to sacrifice as a burnt offering their only son. And so they go up, and Isaac has a question there in verse 7. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Normal question. Kids curious. Question, you know, it's like, Dad, hey, wait, we're going to the burnt offering, and, you know, but uh, wait a minute. Uh, where's the lamb? In verse 8, a Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And that's, that's the next point. God will provide. Abraham believes God will provide for him. He has faith. He trusts in God. He is obedient in the midst of his flaws. And he believes God will provide. And they, they go up on the mountain, and, and he's raising the knife and ready to... Kill his only son. And then he's told by the angel, do not do anything to him in verse 12. Because you have withheld from me, guess what? Your son, guess which one? Your only son again. And then Abraham looked up and there he saw the ram caught by the horns. Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And then the angel in verse 15 called Abraham from a second time and said, because you have done this and not withheld your son, here it is again, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the city of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Abraham demonstrates his faith. How many of us are standing up in faith right now? How many of us are willing to sacrifice something? And stand up in faith. The, the, the key to all this. Men, step up. Be faith leaders. Let's not cower in the corner waiting for God to get us out of the situation. Is Let's stand up in faith. Because that last verse is so key. And that's the last point. Your descendants will take possession of the cities and through your offspring of the, all nations on earth will be Blessed. You and I sit here this morning. We live in this land of bountiful and plenty. And we are blessed because we are followers of Father Abraham. And we can just walk out and say, well, that's great, we're blessed. But I think we can't leave here without asking the question. Who in the future is going to be blessed because you today are obeying God. Who today is going to stand up like Abraham and listen, be obedient, and follow God and obey God so that people, or children or grandchildren, future nations will be blessed because of the people of faith here today? will be blessed because of you you're the only one that can answer that question
Because you're the only one who can make the decision of whether you stand up and be obedient. Be patient. Trust in God. Let's pray. Almighty, everlasting God. We come before you today acknowledging that we are blessed. We are blessed because we know the name of Jesus Christ. And it's not just a a head knowledge. We know him personally. Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Lord, we thank you that we can live in a time where we are blessed. Lord, there, there is persecution, there is hardship, there is danger, there is anger, there is hatred, there is all sorts of things that are going on in our world. But most importantly, we're blessed to know you. And so, Lord, we ask that you just reveal yourself in the midst of the dark hour. We confess, Lord, that there are times that we do sin. We do have that that, that flaw within us, Lord. We do have a sinful nature. Each and every one of us. We're born into it. We live with it. The only thing we can do is, is acknowledge it, confess it, and seek to make changes, Lord. So, Lord, from our hearts we confess the sins that we have committed against you, the sins that we have committed against others. And we pray, Lord, that you will forgive us. Lord, some of the sins are sins that we have have not done. In the story of the Good Samaritan, people walk by on the other side. Lord, forgive us for the time that we've ignored or we've turned away from needs. Lord, we we thank you for providing for us not only your son, Jesus Christ, but our our daily physical and spiritual needs. We we ask, Lord, that you be with the needs of our world. We ask for peace in the midst of all the turmoil. We ask for your love to radiate in and through us and to all people. Lord, we, we pray that people will make wise decisions beginning with us and moving up the the ladder to those in authority over us and authority over others. Lord, may everyone acknowledge and bow the knee before the one and only God. Acknowledge that's the authority that we must be obedient to and listen to. Lord, we pray for our, our congregation as we go through these times. Some may be struggling uh, financially. Some may be struggling spiritually because it's been a while since we've been able to to gather as the full body of Christ. Lord, we ask that you be with the the physical needs of our congregation. We pray for Ed Hansen as he prepares for back surgery uh, on Wednesday. Be with he and Connie, give them safe travels, and we just pray the doctor will be able to bring relief to his hurting body. We pray for uh, Michelle Copes and uh, the family as they mourn the loss of her uncle John this past week. Surround them with your love. We pray for Sandy Ross and the loss of Peck. uh, Just lift her up to your throne of grace. We pray for Jerry Phillips as he uh, prepares for his his, uh, treatments for his cancer. We thank you for... uh, the successful surgery for Sue McFerrin, Merle Burkumpus' daughter, and she's dealt with cancer, and now that her body will heal and be with her. Uh, for others, Lord, who have hurts and pains deep within them, Lord, and just it's too painful to express, too painful for talk about, and we just bottle it up inside, Lord. We just pray because you know it. We don't know the names. We don't know the situations, but you know it, Lord, so we ask that you just bring healing healing and comfort to the broken hearts and the broken lives. Lord, we just come before you today and know that 
you have a plan. You have a plan that you've laid out in your word. And we need to be faithful and patient as we wait for Jesus' return. When there'll be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. When we rejoice together and gather together around the banquet table in heaven. So until that time, Lord, keep us close to you. Help us to remain faithful. Lord, hear us now as we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We stand and join in singing, Happy the home where God is there. to gather together and celebrate the Lord's Supper. For those of you who will be attending, you will pick up individual cups that are individually wrapped as you come into the service. Will we not be passing the plate? For those of you at home, if you want to gather some bread and some juice together, you can partake with us also on that day. So we want to prepare for that. So brothers and sisters in Christ, we propose, we propose to celebrate together with the gracious help of God the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, the next Lord's Day. Our conscience, instructed by God's law, rightly declares us unworthy of this gift. We find that we have neither loved the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. To examine our lives is to confirm that we deserve exclusion from this royal banquet, and indeed from God's presence forevermore. Yet this is God's feast of love. And it was in love that Christ gave himself for us. When we were unworthy, Christ made us worthy. When we should have justly died as punishment for our sins, Christ freely paid, dying on the cross in our place. Christ has become our complete righteousness. Therefore, our self-examination must not end in despair. We're called to trust God's work on our behalf and to receive the gift of forgiveness offered us in Christ Jesus. Our reconciliation to God is found in trusting this good news that we, before we chose God, God chose us. We are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Partaking at the Lord's table is not an act of virtue. This table is prepared for those who humbly 
trust God alone and find in his death, resurrection, and ascension their only peace. Though they often fail in their efforts, those who approach this table will desire to please God, conforming their lives to God's purposes. Rest fully assured that when God finds such contrite trust and godly intention, God will forgive all our sins and make us worthy partakers of this heavenly kingdom. As we examine ourselves, let us confess our sins. Let us pray. Lord, we know. We know we have sinned against you and against one another. We've done that not only in word and deed, but also in, in thoughts, in our mind in the things that, that we've done against you and against our brothers and sisters in Christ, we seek forgiveness. We pray before you that you will hear the groanings of our heart right now, that we will examine our life throughout this week and see what we need to do, where we need to seek forgiveness from you or for others, from others. Lord, lead us to your throne of grace. In your mercy, Lord, Forgive us for what we have done and been. Help us to amend what we are. And direct us in the path of what we should be. Following the footsteps of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In whose name we pray. Amen. The assurance of pardon. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might live. Our gracious God forgives your sins, strengthens you by the Holy Spirit, and will keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As you leave today, there is a yellow sheet on the table by the glass doors as you leave. Ask that you pick it up um, this was prepared, prepared by uh, a couple of our elders, uh, and, uh, or an elder. You prepared this, right? By Nancy. Sorry, get my straight. Don't want to give credit where credit is not due, and not credit where credit is due. You can follow me, right? Um, pick one of these. Nancy has prepared for us a, a daily um, thing f starting tomorrow through the week uh, of prayers and preparation for communion. So pick one of that up. We'll also email that out, but pick one up as you leave today. This is a time in our service where we take our offering today. If you brought an offering, you can put it at the plate as you leave the sanctuary or the door uh, in the lobby. There's a plate there. And as we offer our gifts and talents, we now offer ourselves, and John is going to lead us in a special number. The song I'm about to sing is based on Jeremiah 29, 13, which reads, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Thank you. 
John for that reminder as we close the service of what we've been talking about today. Please stand for the closing blessing. We want to thank you for coming to worship and for those who are worshiping uh, uh, at home. We want to thank you for being part of our worship today. also want to remind you that the ushers will come and dismiss you uh, uh, by rows as you leave and that if you could exit outside, uh, you can uh, don't mingle in the lobby, please, and uh, you can visit out in the parking lot and join together in fellowship there, but try to go out as quickly as you possibly can in the most direct manner. Receive now the closing blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen.